Please join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on this place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. In new ways this year, more than any other year, I find myself more deeply relating to the crowd in today's Palm Sunday story. They're waiting for a savior. They're tired, tired of Roman rule, tired of living in worry and fear, tired of waiting for the arrival of a new Messiah, a new promised Messiah who would turn things around. They wanted a king. They wanted someone who would swoop in and save the day. And they wanted a warrior, someone to fight their battles for them. Ultimately, they wanted peace. Sound familiar? Wanting it all just to be better, wanting everything to swiftly turn around in one big swoop of peace and goodness. It's in this place we find the crowds on Palm Sunday this morning. And seeing through their desire, their history, and their culture, they saw the fulfillment of their long-sought need. The Lord coming to save the city and her beloved children, the sons and daughters of Zion. They saw this being fulfilled in the embodiment of Christ. For in his entry into Jerusalem, many heard echoes of the great Zechariah's prophecy that the day of the Lord would be fulfilled when the Lord would enter Jerusalem, coming down from the Mount of Olives to secure and save the city. And to add to this, when Jesus entered the city, he came riding specifically on a donkey. And this style of entrance, riding on a horseback of sorts, echoed the ultimate entry of Roman power. His decision to enter the city not on foot, but on the back of a donkey, was reminiscent of victorious kings and war heroes returning to Jerusalem on war, house, war horses after having conquered and won a long-fought battle. In this way, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem brought forth images of Roman power and religious fulfillment. And these intersecting images to the eyes of the crowd felt so self-evident, so clear, that the only seeming conclusion, especially after all the rumors of Christ's wonderful deeds of healing the sick, loving the discarded, and feeding the thousands, was that the true king, the fulfiller of peace and justice, had arrived and was here today. So the people laid down their cloaks. They took the coats off their back, the cloaks that kept out the hot sun and the dirt and the germs and the thieves. They laid down their protection at Christ's feet. They grabbed the things around them, the palms and the branches from the trees and placed them at his feet, forming a royal carpet of sorts. And they shouted, Hosanna, 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 son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is an Aramaic word. It is simultaneously an exclamation of praise and an exhortation meaning save us or help us. It is both a praise and a plea both thanks and a cry for intervention. And is it just me or does this cry sound really familiar right now? It's as if the crowd then in first century AD was reading the room now in our modern day year of 2020 and uttering the words deep down in our own guts, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, O blessed one. Hosanna in the highest, Intercede on our behalf, O Lord. Bring your peace, bring your justice, bring the peaceable day of the Lord when all and all and all shall be made well, when there should be no more pain or disease or death. Hosanna, Holy One. Hosanna in the highest. Since we're all at home right now, I want to encourage you to do something a bit different than you otherwise would when listening to a sermon. 
I want you to pause and look around you. Where are you right now? It's not a bustling street full of 200,000 people. It's not Jerusalem. And Christ surely isn't arriving in a donkey into whatever room you're in. But you are in your home. And it is, at least for now, your place of shelter and security. So in your home, in your Jerusalem, if Jesus were to come to your front door, how might you greet him? How, what might you lay at his feet? How might you prepare your home and your heart to welcome him? In Holy Week, this week, we have two charges. First, prepare. Prepare your heart and your home to meet Christ. Prepare to meet and prepare to be tended to. And in this preparing, be willing to shout or to whisper, Hosanna, praise you, O God. Hosanna, help us. This Holy Week is going to look different for all of us. Different because we can't rely on the same rituals and gatherings and celebrations as we're used to. And different because we're living in a moment of uncertainty and fear. With this in mind, I think this week especially, Christ wants to care for us in the intimacy of our hearts and in the intricacies of our homes. In this strange time, then, we're invited to go a bit deeper. Try something new. Maybe it's making an altar in your home. Maybe it's clearing off your bedstand and putting your Bible or your cross or your favorite hymn text scribbled down on a piece of paper and setting it aside to remind you that Christ is looking to attend to you and is calling you to do the same for Christ's creation. Maybe it's calling a friend and asking if they want to read the passion story together. Maybe it's sitting in silence for five minutes of quiet prayer every evening before bed. Before bed. What might you do this week to make room for yourself to encounter Christ and to be ready for him to greet you as if he were to walk into your living room? This is the first charge of Holy Week. And the second is to journey with Christ. Journey with, with him, and if it helps in you doing this, journey with us. Journey with your UCY family through Holy Week. We'll gather and have services and devotionals and practices that you can participate in throughout the week. For this week, as he does all the time, Christ is about to break a lot of our assumptions wide open when it comes to how the Lord goes about peacemaking, justice-seeking, and healing the world. Christ is about to show us in the days and time following his triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we celebrate today, that his kingship isn't about might and power as we're used to thinking about them. Instead, it's about community. It's about staying awake with our loved ones who are scared. It's about realizing that we aren't perfect and we aren't meant to be. It's about laying down our swords. And it's about realizing that we can't do this on our own. For Christ, divinity isn't about everything working out in such a way that everything is happy or void of suffering. Instead, his divinity is most tangible when he shows up in our suffering, in our grief, in our fear, in our anxiety, in our sickness, and in all that makes us weak and vulnerable. For you see, Christ in many ways is about to let the crowd down. He's not going to lead a rebellion against Rome as they, some of them, hope. And some of us also are in the midst of disappointment right now. Some of us are grieving. Some of us are sick. Some of us are scared. And all that grief and worry isn't suddenly magically going to disappear. But this is why our second charge is to follow Christ 
through the darkness and seeming despair to Monday Thursday when Christ is going to want to feed us to Good Friday when we'll think that all is lost to Holy Saturday when we'll feel stuck in hopelessness and to Easter morning when illogical abundant life will be made new. Friends, are you ready? We might not ever, of course, be fully ready, but together let's prepare our hearts. Let's lay down our burdens. Let's set down our cloaks and let's create a bit more space to encounter Christ on the journey. So that from our most authentic places, we can say to Christ, Hosanna, we praise you and we need you to save us, to help us, and to deliver us. Amen.